And then finally, there are additives. And they can be anywhere from 10 to 25% of the ink. From the factory or from the supplier or from your ink lab in, in your facility, these additives are initially incorporated into that ink to impart certain properties that you want that are not imparted to that to the ink by the other components. So for a few couple of examples with these waxes, which which help you know with the with the, the scuffing. A photo initiator in the case of UV ink, which we'll go into, it creates a reaction with the ink that makes it usually much more aggressive and remains on the substrate. But it's, you don't want to add it until you're ready to use it on press. You don't want to add it while it's in the ink, ink room because the ink will actually catalyze and part. So that would be an example of an additive that's added before you start printing, but there's not an initial part of the ink. <clears throat> and they fine tune specific pro performance properties. They can add as a process age for unruly inks. For example, with water-based ink, one of the challenges is that uh, bubbles form. And you can have it overflowing from the ink pan in your press or from the bucket. And it's a very aggravating condition. And so you may add some defoamer to control that un unruly ink. And to replenish volatile compounds. In water-based ink, the amine or ammonia that's in there to do something special uh, comes out. So we have to periodically add it to keep it in, uh, in balance. <coughs> now, amine is something that's added to water-based ink to elevate the pH because the water-based inks require an alkaline environment in order for the resin to remain fluid. If the ammonia or amine evaporates from the ink too much, the resin in the ink can actually solidify even though you have water in it. Now, I'm saying all these things and uh, there's all this stuff that you might be going crazy. But um, again, my point here is for you to get an appreciation of just how critical, how sensitive, how variable, and how complex all of these little things that we take for granted are. I, you don't need to memorize this stuff. You can research it to the specifics of your thing. So if you're getting dizzy, don't let it bother you. Now, an amine, uh, to elevate the pH, it might be an ammonia, okay? But ammonia, just plain ammonia, is very volatile. So it comes out of that water base in quickly. You have to replenish it frequently, and it can make for an unpleasant environment with the smell. So there are some other amines that are, for example, one that's called methyl ethanolamine and another one called dimethyl ethanolamine that are more stable. They still have the properties of elevating the pH, but they don't volatilize so quickly. So you don't have to replenish them that quickly and you have a more stable ink over time. Then there's another common additive is a surfactant. And what that does you can see surface, surfactant, is it lowers the surface tension of the ink so that it wets out better. Now, a quick thing about surface tension. When we think of surface energy, uh, fluids have, there's, there are analogs, okay, surface energy. Surface energy. Here is your substrate. The film, paper, foil. Here is a drop of ink on that. Now, liquids have surface tension. That's why you see some little insects that can walk in the water. Because the water has this tension on it. Solids have surface energy. 
In both cases, they're measured in dimes, which is a unit of measure of energy. Now, let's say this, this here liquid happens to have 30, let's say uh, 34 dime surface energy, surface tension. And let's say that this surface here has 32 dime surface energy. In that case, now a, a, a ball of water, a, a, a water ball of uh, a drop of water in space will be a little ball, will be a round dot. And it has this film of ink around it where there's this surface tension. That water, that drop is said to have an affinity for itself. It likes itself. It's happy. <coughs> Along it comes and it touches a substrate, and now it's going to spread on that substrate. Now, there's a relationship between these two, and I intentionally made this one lower than that one. If this ink comes to the substrate, and that surface energy is less than the surface tension of the water, the ink is happier by itself. It's like when you wax your car, and the ball and the water, and the, and the, the, uh, the water turns into uh, big drops. That's because when you put the wax on that car, you have decreased its surface energy. So now the ink, rather than wanting to go or the water onto that car, it says, hey, you know what? There's not enough energy on this surface. I like myself better. That is why when we print on films, we run the substrate through something called a corona treater, which actually uh, an arc of electricity, a nice controlled arc, is applied to that surface increasing the surface energy to let's say 41 dimes or 40 dimes, right? Or maybe 38 or 39, higher than the surface energy of this fluid. Now the dot says, hey, that surface is very attractive. It's got a lot of energy. I think I'll flatten out, okay? So that is where a, what we can do though, if, let's say that this had a higher surface energy, 42, we still have that same relationship where this one, the water, the ink wants to keep to itself more than it wants to spread, so we might add a surfactant to it to lowest the surface tension of the ink so that then that relationship becomes favorable to the ink laying down on the surface of that substrate instead of keeping to itself. Okay? You might have antifoam, as I was telling you before. Now this is However, antifoam is a little bit different from the defoam. Antifoam helps to prevent the foaming, and that tends to be done on the ink supplier side, whether it's the ink company's factory or it's you have a special laboratory in your environment. Whereas defoamer breaks down foam that is already formed. They're similar, but a little bit different. That tends to be done press side, where an operator is controlling. As I said earlier, wax, helps resist scuffing, improves rub resistance so you can't rub it off and it can't come off on your finger. That's usually supplier side. You do not want your operators adding wax to the ink just to make it do something. Photo initiator catalyzes the UV monomers and oligomers. So here we are again with that UV ink and it's got little monomers in there. Among them it's got oligomers and an oligomer is a little cluster of monomers. So they're very similar. Then you have a little photo initiators in there. A photo initiator, photo, light, the UV light hits the photo initiator. The photo initiator gets excited and releases what they call free radicals. So these little ions that have uh, if you remember your chemistry, they have a vacancy in the valence electron ring, which does not like to be that way. So the bottom line is it likes to bond to things. So when we excite the photo initiator and it releases free radicals, these free radicals that don't like to be that way, they grab onto the monomer and the polymer and they can make them bind together and then they're forever that way. That is what makes UV ink go from being a liquid to a solid. Glycol, 
slows down the dot, drying rate of the ink. Dispersants. Pigment is a solid again, right? But it's, it wants to settle, it, or maybe it will want to cluster. Dispersants allow that pigment to be equally distributed throughout the ink, disperses through the ink. Now, there is a fifth component that I'll mention that is not exactly a component. It's a composite of the uh, resins, solvents, and the additives. It's the vehicle. And just like a vehicle carries people, the vehicle of the ink carries the, red, the pigment with it. So, but at, at collectively, we refer to everything in the ink except for the pigment as the ink vehicle. In totality, the vehicle determines the functional properties of the ink, not just the resin. And indeed, the pigment itself is um, part of that com composite and cannot be ignored. So while the vehicle as a whole determines all of those properties, even the pigment participates in that affair. The pigment is held on the substrate by what's left when everything else that evaporates is gone. Okay? Or when the oligomers and the monomers have cured. Now, pigment is not a, a, a part of the uh, vehicle, but as I said, it can affect the behavior and the performance of the ink system. Now, ink is a system, and you may have your vendors call it so as much. It's not just one thing. It's a system, a balancing, a balanced system of, of things that perform a function. So it's a set of interacting, interdependent components forming an integrated whole. And I want you to think of it that way. I want you to think of ink as a system which will automatically divide it out and tell you, hmm, components in there can be varied in ratios. And there may be some benefits or detriments to that. And a rough pie chart. Here's about how much solvent is in ink. The resin and additives and the least component, the one we most associate with ink, is the coloring or pigment. 